For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strat News Global. I am Surya Gangadharan and this evening we are going to look at some of the recent developments in West Asia. Here's a point wise summing up of uh, some of these developments. Earlier this week, the leaders of Egypt, the UAE and Israel met in Sharm El Sheikh in the Sinai Desert in Egypt in the first ever summit of its kind. The Saudi king has referred to Israel as a potential partner. Syria's president Bashar al-Assad was in the UAE a few days ago. His first visits in the civil war broke out in his country in 2011. And two weeks ago, there were reports of the Saudi king and the UAE Sultan refusing to take a call from no one, no other than President Biden on the issue of oil prices. And in the last two years, Bahrain and the UAE have given diplomatic recognition to Israel. More Arab countries are in the queue to mend fences with the Jewish state. So what does one make of these developments? Uh, I have with me Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. Uh, you have met him on our channel before. He was India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and some other countries in the region. Uh, he is a scholar on West Asia and follows uh, politics and other developments there very closely. So welcome. Um, ambassador Ahmed has also uh, come out with his latest book on West Asia. Uh, it's titled West Asia at War. Repression, Resistance, and Great Power Games. Uh, it's just come out recently, and uh, uh, it's available by, uh, it's been published by HarperCollins. Uh, so good to have you again. Thank you very much. Um, so the region is in a state of uh, flux. You have the civil war in Yemen, US Israeli airstrikes on Syria, Israeli airstrikes on the Palestinians. You have uh, maritime skirmishes in the seas, uh, surrounding seas, including the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, you have, of course, the enormous weight of American military power there. Iran is under considerable pressure. Um, and um, so in the midst of all this, there is also a diplomatic political churn that is happening. Uh, what is your sense of this, where it's going, what it's about? I see what is happening in the region as West Asia's response to the nightmare of four years of Donald Trump and one year of the insipid and shaky presidency of Biden. What is happening in West Asia is the resolve of the countries of the region to pursue diplomatic initiatives on their own without the involvement of the Americans. The Americans have lost all credibility as security providers in the region. And at the same time, their own president has indicated that he is disengaging from the region. In this environment, what else are they supposed to do? They are engaging with each other. They are pursuing new alignments, new relationships, and, new, and putting together possible coalitions in order to safeguard their own political and economic interests. This is the central reason, the core, uh, for all this activity that you are seeing. This is at the nascent stage. No firm alliances have been put in place. What we are looking at, uh, what we are looking at is dialogue, conversation, getting to know each other. And you are looking at people talking to, uh, and they are talking to each other when they had not been in conversation till a couple of months ago. So it yeah. is something quite significant and dramatic. So let's come back to your earlier premise about the U.S., about the dis general sense of uh, disappointment and disillusion with the U.S. Who are the main beneficiaries here? I presume it's Russia and China. What is it that they offer? You see, this is, this is a complicated scenario. The United States seems to be fatigued. It is fatigued in respect of its responsibilities in the region. These were self-assumed responsibilities. It had emerged yes. as a as a hyperpower, the sole superpower, a hegemonic power after the end of the Cold War. And then it went from mistake to mistake to mistake. It is a kind of hubris. 
the assault upon Afghanistan was immediately followed by the assault upon Iraq. And then they were involved with regime change in Libya. And all of these were complete fiascos. It has debilitated the country and it has debilitated the region as well at the same time. So there is a kind of mutual fatigue very clearly in place today. It is in this scenario, in this background, that various grievances have emerged as far as West Asia is concerned. Many countries of West Asia believe that the Americans have been less than supportive in terms of their interests. At the time of the Arab Spring uprisings, the Americans had done nothing to support Hosni Mubarak. Later mm -hmm. on, when there was evidence of chemical weapons being used in Syria, the Americans had backed off again. They had engaged with the Iranians in terms of the nuclear agreement. And more recently, when there were uh, the, when the, when they were Houthi attacks upon the Syrian uh, upon the Saudi facilities, the Americans again had done nothing. And then final blow uh, was the fiasco relating to the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It yeah. was a kind of death uh, blow. Uh, as far as America was concerned, its credibility as a security provider was now below zero. It is in this environment over a period of time, I would say for nearly two years, they have been talking to each other, thinking about how they could reshape their, their various differences and their relationship. And I think this is why they have decided to go forward. So uh, what about Russia and China? Are they the main yeah. gainers? It is in this background. Actually, Russia and China have been active in the region for quite some time. China a little more low-key, but much more vigorous, particularly as far as economic partnerships are concerned uh, and its logistical connectivity projects. It is a major buyer of energy from the region and it's a major executor of projects in the region. Russia intervened in the region from 2015 when it came to Syria and prevented regime change. Since then, it has become a significant diplomatic presence in the region. Moscow had become the go-to capital. It has built up a lot of resonance across the region. As far as Turkey is concerned, it is a political, economic and military partner. It is a significant supporter to the Iranians. It is talking very strongly to the Saudis and is a partner as far as OPEC plus is concerned. So it's, there is a kind of energy synergy there. It is also an alternative military supplies provider as well. So at a time when the Americans are losing credibility and possibly losing interest, the Russians and the Chinese have been there for the last few years. And I think there is now in the context of Ukraine, it is very clear to us, none of the countries of the region wants to take sides. Many of these countries that I have named have been actually very close allies of the United States. Yeah, and today, when the, when the United States needs them desperately, none of them has come forward to support the United States. You can see a sea change as far as their perspectives are concerned. So, uh, Russia and China, they are uh, they have friends across the traditional divides in uh, in that region, isn't it? See, there is no traditional divide now. There is, they have brought a lot of value to the table. China is one of the major economic players in the world. It came up with the idea of the Belt and Road that was very imaginative. And it has got the support of 140 countries. Uh, West Asia is a very major presence as far as the Belt and Road Initiative is concerned. China is the number one trade partner for almost all the countries in the region. Yeah. And it is also executing projects valued at over $100 billion. It is the number one energy buyer from the region as well. And, uh, mm. it is, and this is likely to continue for another 20 or 30 years. Potentially, it is also a supplier of military equipment as far as the region is concerned. You will recall in this context that after the UAE got cheesed off with the Americans and cancelled the, the, their, their order, for the, for the F-35 aircraft, it went and bought certain su uh, su you know, supplies from the Chinese. So China has, in a very low-key way, 
It has not made any political statement. It has not stated it wants to be a security provider. It does not want a military or political role just yet. But I think it is preparing the ground for that. As far as Russia is concerned, they have been much more overt in this regard. They have created a, a situation of credibility. Just as, I, as the Americans are losing credibility, these two countries working very carefully together are actually showing themselves as substantial partners for the stability of the region and for its economic uh, you know, prosperity. And uh, also as security providers, because Russia is already there, uh, the Chinese would I, be next in line? I would say that there is, they don't want to substitute for the Americans. Firstly, they cannot. Even though the Americans have lost uh, credibility and are perhaps fatigued, their armed forces are still there. Yeah. You have in Bahrain the Fifth Fleet, and then at, uh, at the Al Uded, you have their air force. All across the region, you have several thousand troops, you have special forces, you have American presence uh, even now in Iraq as well as Syria, and they are not going anywhere. I don't think the Americans are going to withdraw their armed forces from the region. So they are, will remain. It would suggest to me that regardless of who rules in the White House, Pentagon continues to call the shots as far as certain crucial American interests are concerned. What the Americans are talking about, particularly their political leadership, is getting less involved with the quarrels of the region. And which is why you are looking at all this diplomatic activity. But mm -hmm. I don't think Russia and China want to come in at this stage and become security providers in the military sense. The role they are likely to play, and indeed we are already seeing that, is a diplomatic role. How you can promote peace and stability in the region, how you can get certain people to be talking to each other, and they can at the same time bring value to the region in terms of what they have in terms of their own assets. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you see the current... Um negotiations over the JCPOA and Iran uh, in this in this entire context that you have uh, sketched for us? Yes, the JCPOA has reached its last stage. And as you can imagine, the last stage is possibly the most sensitive. Absolutely. And as is the rule in all negotiations, nothing is done until everything, nothing has been achieved if uh, mm -hmm. unless everything is achieved. So even though you may have, may have agreed on 99 points, it is the last point that will decide whether you can go forward or not. According to reports, the, the sticking point is the removal of the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, who are the guardians of the revolution and are part of the Iranian constitution and have an institutional presence in the country. They were placed on the foreign terrorist organization list by Donald Trump, just yeah. when he was imposing, just as he had withdrawn from JCPA, from the JCPOA, he had in August 2019 placed the IRGC on this FTO list. It was controversial even at that time. This, you know, it doesn't fit many of the of the definitions that the Americans use with regard to a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. it, is like a, it is like a parallel armed force in our country. We have BSF and CRPF yeah, playing yeah. certain significant security roles in our country. And I think mm -hmm. the IRGC does that as well. It is the crucial defender of Iranian security, particularly its borders and the Persian Gulf itself. Putting such an organization in the FTO uh, is a complete travesty. But it was, it was Trump pandering to his right-wing constituency at home and to sections of the Israel lobby, and he did what he had to do. He also did it very deliberately. He wanted his successor to find it impossible to rehabilitate Iran. Hmm. And that is why he had done many of the sanctions that he had put in were not on the basis of the nuclear project. It was done on the basis of... Uh, uh, of uh, human rights or support for terrorism, etc. So all of these uh, uh, were something that 
Biden has to navigate. And Biden is in a serious difficulty because he is uh, he has himself very low credibility at home. Large parts of his domestic uh, you know, agenda have not gone forward. Large sections, some sections of his own party are opposing him in the Senate. So he's not going anywhere. He mm. looks pretty pathetic as of now. And then you have this nightmare of the November elections. In this kind of scenario, a de facto lame duck president could become a de facto, uh, I mean, he could become a de jure, uh, 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 you know, lame duck. And that is a nightmare for him. If there is already, uh, you have the right wing voices, which are saying under no circumstances will they ever allow uh, the administration to remove the FTO tag from the IRGC. So you have, this is the sticking point. How do you go forward? It is very easy for the Americans to say it now depends on the Iranians. It doesn't yeah. depend on the Iranians. It depends on both of them. You can't mm. negotiate except as equals. This is the last point. And this is largely symbolic. It is For the Iranians, it is something a matter of national. Uh, it's a matter of national concern. For the Americans, you know, Iran is a state sponsor of terror in their lexicon and has been for several years. Large sections of their institutions are under sanctions even now. So it's not as if there will be a material change on the ground if the IRGC's FTO tag is removed. But it is important. And if Biden wants to win in November, uh, he will have a tough time if he removes this tag now. So we are now listening to this. What the Americans are asking Iran is make a public so it's, quite, it's part of facing a saving face. Yeah. We want the Iranians to make a public statement that it will not be a source of tension, competition in the region. Now that is it's a very open-ended statement. Yeah, it, <laughs> the Iranians have said, it appears, that they are not going to make such a major statement in public. They, in fact, deny yeah. that they are a source of, of tension and they are a source of escalation in the region. What about uh, what about the Israelis? If you see yeah. their conduct over the last yeah. years, if there is anyone with a source of escalation and tension, it is the Israelis. Yeah. Much more. Yeah. Iranians very often are at the receiving end, one would mm -hmm. say. But having this is the point. You are finally at the end game, and that is connected with the JCPOA. Where do we? Uh, that is connected with the IRGC. Where do we go from here? Now the Noro's holidays have started. They are going to be two week long. Uh, there is a sort of recess uh, as of now in Vienna. Uh, will what will happen? People, both one side, Americans say it's a matter of a few days. It's all or nothing. Some others say wait for the for the holidays to be over. No one wants to say the talks are over. But no one also knows how to move forward on the IRDC question. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned the Israelis. Uh, they've been building, they've also been a major beneficiary of the um, change in uh, attitude in the region towards it. You know? uh, at the same time, they're also very hardline on Iran. While also building relations with the Arabs, the UAE, I mean, the Saudis are still out on that, uh, yet to sign on. But Bahrain has joined in, Oman is joining in. I wanted to clarify certain matters to you. Yeah. The Arabs for 20 years have never denied the existence of Israel, mm -hmm. nor have they denied their desire to have ties with Israel. You will remember in 2002, 20 years ago, Saudi Arabia had proposed the Arab Peace Plan, the yeah. Arab Peace Initiative, it was called. It then became, it was then adopted by, by the Arab League. What was offered at that time? That all Arab countries would normalize relations with Israel if Israel were to move forward in its negotiations with the Palestinians. Yeah. and resolve matters relating to the occupied territory. The details of this were not spelt out. There are no conditionalities attached to this. It's a matter between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What the Israelis want 
is that they want to have relations with these other Arabs, but they don't want to talk to the Palestinians seriously. Yeah. So you, this is the problem and this has remained the problem. Now, it is absolutely true that as far as the military side is concerned, the Palestinian issue ceased to be an Arab issue in 1967. After that, Israel went forward. I mean, at that time, Egypt went forward and they then did their own peace process. And yeah. to some extent, uh, uh, Jordan also joined in. So you could say that two Arab countries had a kind of normalization of relations all those years ago after Camp David. What you saw in August 2020 was something quite different. UAE came forward to normalize relations. And this was Tom uh, uh, Tom as something dramatic and significant. It frankly was not. Mm. The Emirates is a country, it's an important country. It's a rich country, but it's a very, very small country. In mm. its own country, in the UAE, Emiratis are about 12 to 15 percent. Indeed, mm. I would remind you that Indians are 60 percent. So yeah. it's a country with fairly limited strategic value as far mm. as the wider Arab cause is concerned. And even then, the palace, they were emphatic. And the leaders of the UAE were, had emphasized at that time that they are not abandoning the Palestinian cause. After that, who else came forward? Bahrain, uh, which, as you know, is one of the is one of the smallest countries in the world with very limited yeah. population and, frankly, no strategic value. Yeah. Morocco came in because of the bargain that Trump entered into with them that he would recognize Western Sahara. Yeah. It's a controversial matter. And where Sudan is concerned, they said, we will remove the terrorism tag from you. So you can see American opportunism at its best. Yeah. I personally attach no strategic significance to these four overtures. Nor do I believe that there is a long queue of Arab countries wanting to normalize. I don't think there is going to get a fifth country in the near future. All of them are sensitive to the Palestinian cause. Even if certain leaders are not, let me be very, very clear on this. The people of West Asia are very, very clear that they are committed to the Palestinian cause. You can, what the Israelis are doing is, I think, making a mistake. That you are going forward with regard to engaging with certain Arab countries and yeah. believing you have scored a big hit as far as the Arabs are concerned. But you have not. You still have serious unresolved issues right there staring at you in the face. And unless you resolve those, I don't think it's a serious, significant matter at all. Sitting quiet. You remember that when net and it, there was a lot of domestic politics in play. You know, the timing of that was Trump and Netanyahu were facing election. Yeah, Trump yeah. was, uh, well, according to the according to polls, he was going to lose the election. Netanyahu was facing uh, criminal charges for, for gross misconduct. So there was a domestic value. They wanted to show to their constituency what great statesmen they are. Frankly, both have gone from the arena and uh, hopefully they will remain gone for, <laughs> for a long time to come. But that is something their population will decide. They, mm. they, there was, it was a context this normalization, that context no longer obtains. And I believe the best course for the Israelis is sit down with a credible Palestinian uh, you know, interlocutor and frankly address issues. You cannot get everything that you want. You will need to make some concessions. Yeah. Is this likely to happen in the near future? Very difficult to say. You mm. need to develop an opinion at all. I know that increasing sections of Israeli, uh, you know, of, of, among the Israeli people are now recognizing that we've had this kind of conflict for more than 70 years and we yeah. need to get on. And now engaging with the Arabs, you might just have, and this is where I'm speculating, You, when you start dealing with Arabs, not as enemies, as partners, uh, and you see their cities, the Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, Manama, um, you see their cities, you see confident, uh, affluent, professionally qualified Arabs, 
living yeah. in cities that are among the best in the world in terms of infrastructure possibly, possibly. Possibly, just possibly certain sections of the israelis may start thinking that we've got these people living next door to us as neighbors mm. and talk to them we come all the way 5000 kilometers to talk Europe. to the emirati when the palestinians are 5 kilometers away and you pretend they don't exist yeah. this is a travel so i believe that you could have a change 200000 palestinian i mean 200000 israelis visited dubai in the first few months after normalization 200000 imagine if this trend continues more and more israelis will go back and tell their leaders look these guys are not our enemies yeah they are yeah. people like us we can do business with them we can mm. we are also culturally we have a lot of affiliation our food habits are the same a language is a similar our belief system is similarly anchored every muslim reveres the old testament prophets so i am saying to you that let the israelis resolve their outstanding issues with the palestinians and then you can call that agreement the abraham accord hmm. so last question and the inevitable one and i like you to be brief where does india figure in all this see the sad aspect of all this is that there appears to be an extraordinary focus on the domestic political and economic scenario <laughs> on the part of the leadership my own sense is and i have reflected on this that for a country that believes it is destined to play a significant role in regional and world affairs this divide between the domestic and the foreign policy arena are not are not significant they one actually supports the other one feeds the other and what i would like to see that just as much as the leadership has a certain view and agenda with regard to the domestic situation it should have a similar long term vision with regard to where they would wish to go in terms of regional and foreign affairs what you see instead are sporadic uh, spontaneous ill thought out ill conceived not particularly well pursued initiatives a kind of you know running around uh, with very very little direction and no long term vision also i would say to you that a country that wishes to play a significant role in regional and world affairs and wants to be respected in the councils of the world must present an environment of intense national unity it should shine as an example of pluralism and multiculturalism if you have discord at home and you have animosities nurtured at home it is very difficult for that kind of country to then be a robust presence on the world stage so two points number one set your home in order number two work with a scenario that enmeshes the domestic and the foreign policy agenda the domestic agenda make yourself as strong and credible as possible militarily economically institutionally uh, culturally and then go forward with a long term plan this kind of uh, bilateral and transactional approach which i have criticized i think that is passe your own uh, commentary with me has indicated we are looking at a churn the whole yeah. everyone is talking to everyone else they are pursuing initiatives they are looking at fresh relationships they are looking at new alignments and that is where we should be right in the forefront if there is to be an emerging order india should be a role player in shaping it defining it leading it and you can't do that sitting entirely at home focusing entirely on the next election whether it is municipal or provincial or national so you know this is what i have to say so mm -hmm. i am not i am not able to see that coherent a presence that robust a presence on the regional uh, i mean on the regional and world stage that is our entitlement and that is our capacity so hopefully sir the churn that we are witnessing in uh, west asia will also permit here and you know uh, 
create something new. Um, thank you very much, sir, Ambassador Tilmi, for talking to you. As always, a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to more such conversations uh, going forward. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you. And for those of you who joined us on this conversation, um, thank you for your uh, uh, comments and observations. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Twitter, on other social media, and also Instagram. Uh, thank you and good night.